Uh, Theo Anthony is a writer, photographer, and filmmaker whose work has been featured in The Atlantic, Vice, BBC, World News, and other international media outlets. <coughs> His films have received premieres at the Toronto International Film Festival, Locarno International Film Festival, Rotterdam International Film Festival, South by Southwest, and Anthology Film Archives. In 2015, he was named one of the filmmaker, one of Filmmaker Magazine's 25 New Faces of Independent Film. Rat Film, his first feature debuted at the 2016 Locarno International Film Festival to critical acclaim, with Richard Brody of The New Yorker calling it one of the most extraordinary visionary inspirations in the recent cinema. And Paige Glotzer here is a prize fellow in economics, history, and politics at Harvard University. She received her PhD from Johns Hopkins University. Her research is on the uh, history of housing segregation in the 19th and 20th century and brings together discussions of political economy, cultural history, and the spatial construction of difference. Her book, Building Suburban Power, The Business of Exclusionary Housing Markets, 1890 to 1960, forthcoming from Columbia University Press, congratulations, uh, charts how suburban developers, including Baltimore's Roland Park Company, ushered in modern housing segregation with the help of transnational financiers, real estate institutions, and public policymakers. The effects of their efforts continue to be felt today as we saw. So thank you both for coming. Um, thank you. The two of them will be thank moderating you. their own conversation, and I'll give you a cue when we want to move to Q&A. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, every time I've seen the film, I just continue to pick out new things from it. But there's so much that I'm, I'm very curious about and such a pleasure to finally be able to sit down with you and talk about the film. So let's just start off by, I wanted to ask you, what inspired you to actually make the film? Um, yeah, well, before I start, I just want to say uh, thank you for having me. Um, Paige knows way, way, way more about the history of Baltimore than I do, so I'm like so happy to be on stage with her to sort of elucidate a lot of the concepts. I mean, this film is really just like, I mean, this sort of goes right into the question. This film is really like a, a, a documentation of me learning about my city, um, realizing like how ignorant I had been about my own backyard. Um, I have worked as a journalist uh, internationally and was at a point um, in my career in 2015 where I had been paid to sort of go to other places and tell other people's stories and had felt a lot of um, ethical conflict about that role and me performing that role in the places that I had been. Um, and being in Baltimore um, in April 2015 with the death of Freddie Gray was just this really um, transformative time, I mean, for everyone in America, I think, but um, especially to, uh, you know, to travel, to tell stories, and then to have the world's attention come to your own backyard, and then to take a look at your own backyard with the world and realize how little, like, I knew about it. And so um, I think the best way to answer that question is this film is just a very earnest, sincere attempt at trying to understand um, why Baltimore looks the way it does and um, my place in its history um, and sort of acknowledging um, my own position, my own privilege within the city, and, and uh, you know the position of a historian or artist or whatever you want to call it, um, telling that story. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, you know, there's been so much coverage, so much scholarship on Baltimore, especially concerning Freddie Gray. But one thing I haven't seen a lot of coverage of is rats. So, why the decision to make a film about Baltimore, about your home, using rats? Um, yeah, I, I, it was it was a really organic unfolding. I mean, I didn't set out to. Um, I think I didn't set out to make a film about Baltimore. Um, my own journey of, of of learning about my city um, was. I had no idea it was going to have anything to do with rats. I think um, I had uh, come home one night. I mean, that first shot you see in the film is literally how the film started. Is you see that rat in the trash can and I, had, I came home from the bar one night and I heard this sound and I took out my cell phone and I just, I started recording. Um, and it, I just had totally forgotten that I had recorded it and I just went back to this clip and it was just really haunting. Mm -hmm. You know, this like, this, this, um, this rat stuck in a trash can that's, you know, designed so that it um, can't escape. And, um, it's, you know, uh, a couple days later I, I read an uh, article in the Baltimore Sun um, about this uh, rat rub out team, and they just sounded like 
awesome. They sounded like the Ghostbusters of Baltimore. <laughs> and um, I just reached out, just thinking it'd be like a solo piece. And all of a sudden, I started hanging out with these ex you know, exterminators, and they're all amazing characters. And then um, I started looking into the history of rat poison, and I realized that it was invented in Baltimore. And then you realize that you start looking into who is behind these ideas that went into um, urban planning and pest control. And there's also a lot of overlap with um, residential segregation and that you find that a lot of these same forces were at play. So it was just like this wormhole that was very organically connected. And I think I wasn't creating these connections. I w it felt like I was stumbling on a lot of amazing work and scholarship <laughs> like yours that um, really this, the path was there. And it was just a matter of like setting it about and. Uh, filmic form, so. Huh. Can you take us through that process of what it was like to research for the film, since it does seem to be then uh, really seeing your learning process on the screen? So how did you go about learning what you learned? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the best way I can describe my, like, my research and filmmaking or life process, I just have, it's like I have like 40 tabs open on my Chrome browser at all times and I'm just like clicking through and I just, it's how I digest information. I have a very int short attention span, but I think it's, Increasingly, how a lot of us digest information is we're reading about the Kardashians, then we read about Syria, and then we read about, you know, whatever our government is doing right now, and then it's just it's this it's this mashup collage of and you don't finish articles or you'll start something and then you'll pull up something on your phone because you got bored in the middle of an article and then you'll come back and finish that article and like what is happening to our expectations of editing and and and, and storytelling when that. Um, sense of discontinuity and disruption is inherent in how we um, digest stories. So I, I don't know. That's it's a long-winded answer of saying like I, my what you see on the screen is very true to how I came across the information. If it was a map, it's a map in the film. If it was me hanging out with Harold, like that's us hanging out for the very first time. And I tried to be very true and as like transparent as possible about how I came across this information and. Um, how I put it together in the film. So. Well, let, let's talk about some of those maps um, that you saw. One thing that really struck me was how some of those maps, such as a redlining map, might look very familiar, but when you start to actually map all of those current day statistics onto Baltimore and onto that map, it was amazing to me how much really matched up almost exactly. Um, what was that kind of process like for you? And can you take us through maybe how you kind of came about um, those various kind of correlated correlations and your decision to kind of put them in the film. Yeah, sure. I mean, I was um, I was totally ignorant to the history of redlining in America before this project, and I was just really surprised that something that's had such a uh, overwhelming hand in the shaping of our cities was, you know, not the first thing that you're taught in like a civics or a history class. And um, it's, I mean, it's just. I should also perhaps this, and you're a much you know, uh, higher authority on this, but it's obviously not the only thing that leads to the shaping of cities, but it's one, I think, it's a perfect like metaphor and model for a lot of these policies and ideology behind um, these policies. So um, just, yeah, very practically speaking, um, I uh, came across the work of this um, data scientist named Evan Tukovsky, who um, around the time of the uprising had done a, a big project, um, redlining maps, you know, it weren't just Baltimore, obviously, like uh, every, basically every city, major city. Uh, over 200 redlining maps across the country, big yeah. cities and small. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he did, this, he did this amazing project where he actually overlaid census, overlaid census data on top of redlining maps. Um, but I, also just to complicate things further, and this is like part of, you know, where not everything is clean. It's, you know, I only showed the correlations that matched up, you know, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and that's what's important, you know, when you're thinking about maps is not what you see, but what you don't see, because who gets to in, interpret and make the call of what is signal and what's noise is like, you know, where power is exercised. So, um, yeah, but that's something obviously like you could probably speak to as well. I mean, can I ask you questions? Like, I, like, I'm like, so I'm like, you know, it's only been, I mean, um, and you've done so much more homework than me, but I'm just like so <laughs> curious, like how did you, how did you get started in Baltimore and like what was your research path? Because like you've done so much, this film is like really like 101 and Paige has done like so much like amazing work with like 100 years leading up to this and like, you know, the film sort of leaves off 
after World War II, <laughs> as if like nothing happened after that. Um, and yeah, I, yeah, I'm curious like how you came to this. Well, actually, my, my process was um, almost completely the opposite of yours. Now, I'm, I'm not a native Baltimorean. Um, I actually came there to Johns Hopkins, which, as we saw in the film, is actually a very um, fraught kind of institution in terms of its relationship to the city historically. So to come to Johns Hopkins to study urban history, um, to get a PhD in urban history, um, was also kind of a crash course in learning about my place and the institution's place in the city. And very quickly, um, I started looking through records in the Johns Hopkins Special Collections, and I came across um, realtor records from some of Baltimore's major developers, white suburban developers, um, including the Roland Park Company. And if you um, remember the redlining map in the film, most of those green areas were areas actually developed by the Roland Park Company in the early 20th century. So there is something kind of very enduring about that too. Um, and there was one letter, and I know sometimes, sometimes it's a matter of finding one document that really gets you. But um, there was a letter in 1893, so before the events of, of the film, um, from the developer, the head of the company, to his lawyers, saying, you know, we're thinking about putting racially restrictive, uh, racial restrictions into our covenants to bar uh, African Americans which is not the word he used in that letter. And he said, but you know, there's not really a lot of precedent for it. Is it legal? Can I do it? And the lawyer said no. In 1893, the lawyer said no, a racial restriction um, to prevent black people from buying a house is completely illegal. But they did it anyway. And that's what actually started me in my project. One, it surprised me that there was a question about legality in the 1890s. I would have assumed everyone was doing it in the 1890s. And two, that they saw enough demand and enough kind of, they, they made enough assumptions about what might pr be profitable to basically go and risk doing something completely illegal. Um, and in many ways, that's what I see as one of the major starting points for um, what we see now is still this kind of ossified map um, of Baltimore. Yeah, I mean, uh, something that I really worried about so much making the film was like, and you know, did I just make this regional film, um, you know, about, about Baltimore and, you know, the, wh whose only main you know, cultural reference points for most of, you know, the world are John Waters and The Wire, and or at least cinematically. And um, something that I've found like so one of the major surprises of this journey um i mean this is like three years into taking this film or i mean i started this film like over th almost four years ago so i'm a grown man now um but uh the one of the biggest surprises for me is how much people whether i'm in istanbul whether i'm in in, in porto whether i'm in uh chicago whether i'm in la is people really connect to this story of baltimore and i'm curious why is baltimore such a relevant case study for so many of these things. Mm -hmm. you know, it's funny you mention that because when I have given talks, I love asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> when I've given talks um, inside, like in Baltimore and outside Baltimore, I've I've also actually found just such a high level of interest and in, um, from audiences I didn't expect, uh, especially audiences very far away from Baltimore. Who, you know, I wonder what what interest do people have in this kind of small city, small-ish city relative to what it used to be. Um, and I think that there, there's a, a kind of story here about, you mentioned it, power, about how we see certain people, often white men, developing certain platforms for power, and we see this legacy of how it influences all sorts of things. Resource distribution, um, kind of the sort of macro scale about who gets what, and then we get these personal stories about how that affects if someone can use their backyard, if someone can bring their kids into their backyard because there might be, there might be rats in it. Um, how are neighborhood borders kind of circumscribed and who enforces those? Who gets a stake right, in, the ter in labeling and determining what the city looks like? And I think that that's something that really, um, it has many versions of it wherever you go. Um, you mentioned, I mean, in the film, that in some ways you mentioned this is an American kind of creation myth, but you also mentioned the world. You know, um, when we start looking at power and we start looking at power dynamics, you can really take this in so many directions. Um, and it doesn't have to just be an American city. Yeah. No. no, I remember we had a, there was a screening in Seattle, um, which um, headquarters of Amazon. Um, and 
there's a lot of parallels to be drawn with the presence of um, Amazon um, in Seattle is like Under Armour and Hopkins. Under Armour has its headquarters in uh, Baltimore and they're like the fucking empire. They just own everything along with Hopkins and um, are sort of turning into their playground, um, corporate playground. And there was a lot of Amazon employees in the room and it was really interesting to sort of see these dynamics play out but transpose to an entirely new city. And I think, I mean, you were, you were asking before, I think even before this film started, like what got me, what got me started, and even I have never taken any urban planning courses, I've never done any of this, this was really, as I said, like my education. Um, I lived on this, I think for me what's so, you can already see my attention span, I'm like switching tabs. Um, I, <laughs> what I wanna preface is like, for me, uh, this, this film came out of like, just a really visual curiosity and why the city looks the way it does. And I think you were talking about ossified, and I think it's, it's also like, it's really crystallized into this very like uh, visible form of what racial segregation looks like in the year 2018 and like how these things get recoded and, and um, you know, how people, you know, have normal lives in the midst of that too. And it's not like that black and white. Um, but uh, I always describe Baltimore like this jawbreaker, you know, it's like, it's not a very big city and, you know, you walk from one, um, edge, you know, you can walk uh, east to west across the city and um, see so many different neighborhoods and so many different levels of development and, and states of, you know, investment, divestment, and it's just really in your, in your face. I, this is all to say, I lived on a street called Greenmount and um, on 39th and Greenmount and on the east side of the street are all row homes. Um, middle class, lower middle class, built in, you know, uh, pre-World War II to accommodate like the, the, the rising um, uh, industrial labor population. Right across the street is uh, Guilford and Homewood, which you can probably, was that, that was Roland Park so too. Roland yeah. Park company. So this is like, yeah, the, like the OG, like garden suburb, you know, really where they perfected how to do these things. And, you know, so on one side are all these row homes, on the other side are these like multi-million dollar homes. And, you know, the east side of the street with the row homes are, is all this grid system, right? And on the left side of the street, you can't get in there. There's two hidden entr entrances. And once you're in there, you need a parking permit. And there's no way for foot traffic to get in and all the exits out of the neighborhood. You can see where they were planned, but the neighborhood planning committee has planted flower beds over the turnoffs into Greenmount so that, it, so that traffic can't turn into the neighborhood. And it's like this really banal form of like, these urban planning, like where it's really built to exclude. And you know, it's, you see it all the time. And once you see it, it's just, it's everywhere. It's in parking permits, it's in one way street, you know, it's like, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I, I love that you mentioned Green Mount. Um, we used to practically be neighbors in that case, but. Um, 39th Green Mount, yeah. Yeah, I, I was on 39th Street too. Um, but cool. um, Green Mount, I, I do actually use that as um, one of the starkest visual examples. So for someone who never has heard of redlining, um, I actually, I, I taught at the, um, at Baltimore's art college called MICA, and most of my students had never taken a history class, but we walk that stretch of Greenmount, and we go, we actually go from inside of Guilford, we approach it, and I don't tell them that we're gonna get to Greenmount, and we walk, and there's actually a wall. There's, um, like, there's literally a 14-foot high wall that's been there since 1912, and you walk out of one of the few places you can walk out of it, and I think that is one of the starkest contrasts that you can see in Baltimore. And that's always my students' aha moment. Yeah. When I go, okay, these borders are not a coincidence. Yeah. Right? Um, but one thing that I, I did find very interesting was, um, I think going along with that, is we can talk about neighborhoods, we can talk about borders, but there's this line in the film, um, what is it? He said, um, I think after you talk about redlining and you show the maps, you then kind of juxtapose this sort of blurry image in the rain with the different colors of the lights, and some happen to be red and green and blue, and you say, wouldn't it be nice if the whole city got wet? Mm. So coming as it does after a discussion of redlining, what did you mean by that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, this film, I think, coming, it comes in a, Yeah, I mean, I, I, what I what I really liked about the voice and why I, the, the, this narrator, um, 
I had a real flexibility to move from the more narrative or the historical into the mythical and also the poetic where you're sort of really deep into sort of one way of presenting information and you can just sort of perform this like sideways shift towards, you know, opening up different possibilities. And, you know, as we're talking about all these, uh, you know, all these uh, separations and, and ways of dividing, you know, people, it's also really interesting to think about, you know, other totalizing systems, whether it's weather or anything, and that we're all sort of under the same sky. And, you know, that's obviously like, I mean, you could apply that to a lot of things now, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, I think just um, one last question, since it's been such a pleasure to talk with you. Um, given the context in which you start thinking about this film, the uprising, given the end of the film, um, what might be one sort of major message you want an audience, especially an audience outside of Baltimore, to maybe take away about what they saw today? Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you asked this. I, I think that it's something that comes up a lot. I'm really interested in, in the language we use to talk about film. I mean, obviously, like, you know, you shoot, a f you shoot a camera, you load a cartridge of film. It's all like military industrial terms, you know, with cameras. And I think, you know, you capture your, your subject, you dive deep as if like you're fracking, you know, you have to dive deep beneath the surface to tell the tr real story as if, you know, so when people ask for the takeaway, you know, it's almost like it's this takeout meal, you know, as if like, it's this, it's this the film is like, we're, really groomed for that expectation of uh, a film is something you go and you take away and why that that verb to take rather than like I mean what other language do we have to use that so I think for me I'm not like trying to purposely avoid the question but I always think it's really interesting um, and it really gets to the heart of like why so much issue that I take with like contemporary documentary surrounding especially with like social justice films or films that deal with social issues is that they they have their message, they have their agenda, and it's like a very specific thing. And I think it's really disappointing when very pressing social issues are betrayed by extremely conservative forms. And I think that if you know some revolution or whatever is gonna take place, political action has to take place not on just the stories we tell, but how we tell them and what we expect out of them and like what and how we interact with them. And you know, it's I think with this film, you, it's it doesn't look like it looks more like a Snapchat story than, you know, a uh, 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 National Geographic film. And I think for me, the most thing that my ideal for a um, an audience member is to think about how they're watching a film and to receive information. I'm not God. There's a voice of God, but hopefully the film really tries to distill a deep skepticism of any voice of God or any definitive account, especially mine. And um, yeah, so I think it's just really, you bring yourself to something and you interpret it, and I think if you could think about how you're thinking and come out of that and think about how you might apply that way of thinking to stuff after the film ends, that's the best you could hope for. So, I don't know. The important stuff happens after the film ends, so, um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yep, I think we'll take some questions now. that that woman had uh, looking at and exploring a neighborhood that she wouldn't otherwise have had access to and the sociologists and researchers doing exactly the same thing um, with their experiments. Um, and I guess I have two questions about the use of VR. Um, first, I'm wondering if you have thoughts about VR as sort of a, um, sort of a utopian tool for s transforming society. Um, I know it's talked about a lot in those terms these days. And um, at the end of the film, obviously, there's kind of this utopian vision. So I'm wondering if you have thoughts on that. And then also uh, VR as a form of nonfiction storytelling. Um, so either or, or both of those <laughs> questions. Uh, 
Um, yeah, could everyone hear the question? All right, cool. Um, yeah, well, I have some thoughts, but I don't want to go t too far over the time. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical about VR. Um, I think that, um, I mean, what does, what does VR even mean? It's like, it's just like the, sort of this buzzword, but I think, you know, in terms of having a headset on your head, I think that it is a really um, dangerous and um, something that is like worthy of a lot of like critical discussion that's not happening right now. I think that virtual reality is like maybe the perfect metaphor for a contemporary form of social control where you're given the illusion of freedom and choice within a system that's pre-programmed for you to see. Um, you are given the illusion of a, a, a totalizing system, but those seams that, and the infrastructure that puts the system together is increasingly invisible. Um, and power exerts itself behind the scenes. Power makes you know, erases those seams. And um, I think the idea of um, embodiment and disembodiment is really important when, you know, it's a conversation that just doesn't, doesn't originate in VR. I mean, you can go back to the birth of cinema for, you know, the conversation we're having about virtual reality, virtual reality right now was had in the 20s and 30s with 360 theaters and the sort of the myth of total cinema, um, which is like an essay in the 40s by Andre Bazin, I think. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's the first part. I think, and then in terms of utopian, um, I don't know, I, I don't have, the, 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 the ending I think to me is, is maybe more sarcastic than a utopian thing. I think that the myth of the tabula rasa of like, let's just start again is like, you know, shock doctrine of, of neo, you know, liberal like development and, you know, if only we could start again, if only we could erase the slate, forget our mistakes, but like, how much violence is ex enacted in order to wipe the slate clean and who gets pushed to the margins even more and who gets to build on top of that. Um, and yeah, so I don't know. I, th I think that we never, we very rarely are given the chance to start again and I think it's a much more productive and um, much more productive conversation to have. We assume we're starting from the middle. Um, so yeah, I, I could talk a lot more about virtual reality, but I'm, I'm for the most part deeply skeptical. Um, yeah. yeah. And if I could just jump in for two seconds. Um, what struck me about um, the virtual reality was the idea of an algorithm. And that really had a lot of historical parallels for me. That you're trying to, planners, some of the people we, we saw in the film were trying to program reality based on an algorithm. Redlining was an algorithm. They actually filled out formulas on a sheet. So I think to, to kind of see those seams also speaks to like the, the limits of what seems like an objective um, measure of kind of creating something too. Yeah, mm -hmm. like, yeah, there's this amazing quote by this guy, um, this article like Rob Horning, it's like ideology's trick is always, um, ideology's trick is to always pass it itself off as objective measure. And I think that that's like, it's, it's, it's subjective, arbitrary decisions that are giving the appearance of objectivity and you know a virtual reality experience gives itself you know it's and the thing I'll add on top of that is that um, you know if with virtual reality like you know you're it's total immersion right not total but you know your sight and your sound and meanwhile your physical body is is entirely vulnerable like if you ever watch anyone doing a virtual reality experience it's like they're in the womb you know it's just like they are totally vulnerable to manipulation um, and that I you know, not like literally people are gonna come and poke them, but like you think, I don't know, you just think maybe metaphorically about that, so. Hi there, film was awesome. So my Thank question you. is about I feel like your film like celebrates the mundane, like we see, which is beautiful, right? Like we see the everyday lives of people in Baltimore dealing with this issue. And you talked a little bit about the traditional documentary at the end and you said that, and I'm sort of thinking like in the traditional documentary, they always show the other side of power as you were alluding to, like the decision maker who sort of controls the outcome of the disenfranchise. And in your film, you don't show that perspective, right? Like you don't see that guy sitting at his desk with the camera focused on him. And I wonder why you did that. And I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about why we didn't see that as much in mm. your film. Um, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, I, I was really, 
at the time, it I was really just going from like one character to the next and like one tab to the next without sort of thinking about telling um, the overall tale. And I think that like, you know, that idea of balance, like, you know, the CNN idea of balance that we have like a two, you know, panel discussion and that we have them yell at each other and that's like a balanced conversation. Like, you know, and, and I think my issue with, um, and I'll get to the part of the question at the end, but the, um, I think my issue with a lot of uh, con mainstream documentary, especially social issue documentary, is that the filmmakers place their humans in this like subject box that the, that they then task those humans like to crawl back out of and become human again. And that like deliverance of of a subject, whether it's like you know, oh, let's look at this really poor child in an Indian slum and let's tell his story and you're only understanding that person through their adversity and through their trauma without actually allowing them to define who they want to be on screen. And I think that it's this really unfair trick that is really entertaining and it gets consumed really fast and you have a really take a good takeaway message of poverty equals bad, humans equal resilient, and like you just, the funding cycle continues. And um, I think I try to not come with that box and to like see how people, if I give them a platform, what is the version of themselves that they want to show me? I think that if you look at the film, a lot of it's just like people giving me tours, like walking around. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know how I can, in, in terms of like, why didn't I show like the power? I, I don't know who I would, I would show, I mean like, I could do a ride along with police, but the police are following orders. And then I could do a ride along with the mayor, but the mayor is going to give me sound bites. You know, I think for me, I'm with the like with the film is called Rat Film, but I never really try to understand what a rat is. I just am const I'm more interested in the rat as like this gravitational center, and how does how are all these other subjects and ideas and people and histories drawn into orbit around that? And I think the film is this is this circumnavigation of that orbit. And um, I feel like I'm still not really answering your question, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I just don't know, like, and also like sometimes those people are really boring. And like, I, I think like, I mean, you can hear it when Harold talks, like Harold is so sick of his bosses, you know? It's like, you can hear it in his voice and he's just like, I mean, I have so much great material that I didn't put in there because I didn't want to get him in trouble, but like, uh, you know, of him just railing against his boss, like that's the management, that's the boss man. And like, so you feel that there, but you don't necessarily have to, you know, visualize the boss man to feel the impression that like the boss man's leaving all over the place. But, yeah. Um, we'll take uh, two more quick questions. Um, you talked a lot about like subjects and power. I was just wondering, it's a really quick question, who was your intended audience? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I really didn't think anyone was going to make this, see this film. I like, I, I, so I shot this film uh, for like a year and a half by myself. Um, I self financed it, like saved up money. And I mean, it was just like I bought a lens and like, I shoot it, I edit it, I write it, and um, I had an entire first cut of the film, um, and I was working this like for two years, and it was like my secret, you know. And I didn't, I don't know. I, I made shorts and stuff before, and so I knew there was potentially like a festival audience, and that people, you know, had heard things about it. But like I, I don't know. I was just was if I figured that like if this is my first film, I'm gonna like make exactly the film that I want to make because I'm never gonna get this opportunity again if it's successful. Like. And if I'm gonna do it this first time, like I'm gonna like really do it in a way that like people c can come back to <laughs> me if it's successful for the film that I wanted to make. Does that make sense? Uh, but like I don't know. I just like I I didn't think that I didn't really think in an audience. And I think that um, my dad's an architect, and I think very. Oh, I think of I literally think of making a film like building a house. You know, you don't build a house for an audience, you build it in a way that, you know, people can get in and out and have experiences. And an architect 
can be a designer and can enable or disable certain experiences. And I think um, this was a film that I tried to build with like a lot of entry points into it. I think that if you're coming along for like a like a Ken Burns like archival thing, there's some of that. If you're coming in for like, oh, here's these rat hunters, like, and you want to get your violent kick, like, I don't know, that's that's there. But like, there's there's a lot, and I think. Once you're inside the house, though, you can go to all these different levels. And I think it's the job of the filmmaker to design an experience that allows people access to all these different levels of interpretation. Like, I mean, I could talk about, like, what this film has to say about documentary and reality and a relationship, like, spirituality. I mean, I could, if people want to go there, I mean, they have gone there, and that's really cool. Um, but if you just want to sort of stay at the ground floor and see a bunch of rats, like, it's there, too. So I, I think... Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's it's not about what audience, but like making sure you have an accessible building. So, and one final question. Okay. Thank you for this film. Um, I kind of wanted to talk a bit what you were saying earlier, as far as why would anyone care about your city and like it being a small city. And I guess this can be for either of you. Um, with redlining, um, I feel like we generally talk about major cities like New York, LA, Chicago. Um, Wait, we're not a major city. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm from I'm from Virginia, so like. Okay. Um, but I think sometimes we don't go to the smaller cities, um, and especially cities in the South. I know there's been like some work on like, um, what is it, New Orleans, but there's not really a lot, or at least from what I've seen, um, a lot of films or um, content towards Southern redlining and segregation in that sense. And so I, I just wonder like, is there a bigger impact to be told there more so because I guess redlining there, you'd have less opportunities to move around as you do sometimes in a city, a major city. Um, I can answer, I can start answering this one. Um, Baltimore is actually unique in many ways in terms of its importance for um, the history of residential segregation and for housing. Um, but part of it is geographic. Um, it's a border city. I mean, it was, uh, Maryland is south of the Mason-Dixon line, but it was in the Union. And it historically has had the largest free black population you know, while it was a slave state. So we're already dealing with a city that in some ways was very exceptional, and that was one of the reasons why it had the very first residential segregation ordinance, the one in um, 1911. And that was copied mainly by southern cities. Um, so what you actually see is Baltimore as a jumping off point for places in the south um, and in the north, but especially in the south, um, actually looking towards it as a model to copy. And a lot of what I do in my work is actually follow the people from Baltimore as they become national figures, as they talk to one another. And Baltimore's restrictive covenants, for instance, make their way as far as California, um, Texas, uh, Chicago. So it actually is a hub of um, innovation for kind of racial segregation. Uh, and in some ways, it still is. I mean, I think that. Uh, especially now as we see the way that gentrification is starting to work in the city, the ways that um, policing uh, continues to basically um, really shape people's mobility. It is still a hub for looking at how race and racism is working in America. Yeah, no, I mean, and but also like the point of like, um, I mean, that does sound like a really interesting film and it sounds like there's something to be made there. <laughs> um, I think in that case, you know, I don't, I'm from Baltimore, so like I was exploring my own backyard, but I think that there's a film to be made there. And there's, a, there's a, I just saw like, I mean, maybe there is like a tradition uh, of, there's a couple of films who've come out really recently, like about, maybe not specifically to redlining. Um, there's a film by uh, Travis Wilkerson called uh, Did You Wonder Who Fired the Gun? Um, it just came out, and um, these are not like as urban planning focused, but it's like just life in um, cities in the South, and then my favorite film restored my faith in filmmaking. It was in the darkness for a while, but um, there's a new film coming out called Hale County This Morning, This Evening by Ramel Ross. And like, it's uh, about this town in Alabama and it's just, it's like breathtakingly beautiful. And um, that just premiered at Sundance and will be coming to festivals and um, theaters hopefully soon after. So if I just can't, that 
if I can end it just on a recommend, like a full-hearted recommendation, I can't. Ramel is like so such a beautiful person as well, and um, has made such an, an amazing film. And so definitely check that out when you get a chance. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.